Latvia called out for pushing back hundreds of migrants and asylum seekers. New allegations cast light on what some call a double standard that's violating international human rights law. So why are some being treated differently than others? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmakers are those seeking refuge in Latvia. Nine months ago, a refugee crisis on Belarus's border with Latvia, Poland, and Lithuania dominated global headlines. Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko was accused of orchestrating the crisis by turning refugees, mostly from the Middle East, into political weapons. So, to stop the thousands of people who'd flown to Minsk from entering the EU, troops were called in, fences went up, and thousands of migrants and refugees were left to languish in inhumane conditions on the border. Now, while that story no longer saturates the news cycle, hundreds of migrants and asylum seekers remain on that border. And Latvia feels their presence merits an extended state of emergency to keep Iraqis, Afghans, and others out. Amnesty International says that policy needs to end immediately. The organization says human rights laws are being violated and people's lives are at risk, with Latvia subjecting them to ill treatment and even torture forcing them to seek shelter in forests. They're calling on the government to restore the right to seek asylum in Latvia to everyone. So while Latvia may be blocking mostly Middle Eastern migrants and asylum seekers on its Belarusian border, it is proudly welcoming tens of thousands of Ukrainian refugees. Last week, the government released official data saying more than 36,000 Ukrainians have been registered in Latvia since February. And most of them have been given residency and work permits. Well, that stark contrast in policy didn't just catch the attention of Amnesty. The World Health Organization also took notice and says the contradiction is occurring throughout Europe. The whole attention to Ukraine is very important, of course, because it impacts the whole world. But even a fraction of it is not being given to Tigray, Yemen, Afghanistan, Syria, and the rest. A fraction. And I need to be blunt and honest that the world is not treating the human race same way. Some are more equal than others. And when I say this, it pains me because I see it. Latvia, though, says its critics have got it all wrong. The country's ombudsman even appeared on TV to say Amnesty's allegation of mistreatment by border guards is a lie. He said, quote, my colleagues and I have been on the border. Colleagues are regularly on monitoring visits to the border and at checkpoints where legal Ukrainians also arrive. Let us say that our services actually do the best as far as possible. So are human rights organizations like Amnesty getting it wrong? Or is this simply a blatant double standard that actively discriminates against non-white and non-Christian migrants and refugees? Let's ask our panel. And joining me now, all from the Latvian capital, Riga, our asylum and migration policy analyst with the NGO I Want to Help Refugees, Ieva Rabishko. Maris Anjans is the director of the Center for Geopolitical Studies and an assistant professor at Riga Stradins University. And Yuris Kaja is a Latvian journalist who's been covering the region for the past two decades now. Thanks all so much uh, for being with us. Maris, I'll start with you and first help us understand the state of emergency here and why Latvia thinks that it's not only necessary, but needs to be extended. Well, uh, it's, it's about the context. So it's uh, not a usual uh, refugee or migrant crisis. So this is basically a state-sponsored uh, human trafficking, or you can call it also weaponization of migration by Belarus. So Belarus has uh, organized streams of migrants from the Middle East. They have traveled to Minsk or other places, and then they're being directed towards the border of uh, Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia. And in fact, Latvia is the, the smallest, uh, so to say, victim 
and this uh, hybrid attack by Belarus, because uh, most of the people um, uh, who travel to Belarus are directed towards Poland and Lithuania, so Latvia receives only a small portion. Mm. So the issue is, is still, uh, uh, so say, ongoing. Uh, so in the several weeks, uh, okay. Well, well let me pick up on that though, because again. if you say such a small proportion actually has made it to the Latvian border. Mm -hmm. Why does it merit this state of emergency? Is Latvia in danger by the small number of people? Well, it's not only about the migration. As you know, uh, Russia has invaded Ukraine, and uh, Belarus is complicit. Belarus has uh, allowed uh, its territory to be used by Russia to invade Ukraine. So basically, we have to see also uh, Belarus as a co-aggressor in this case. So it's, it's, it's something that you cannot, you know, turn a blind uh, eye. Fair on. enough. But aside and, from know, the politics between, you know, Belarus, Russia, uh, Ukraine and the EU, these are still people, many of whom have legitimate asylum, uh, claims to asylum, not least the Afghans that are that are languishing at the border there. Why aren't at least applications for asylum being considered by Latvia? Well, there are legal means on uh, how people can apply for asylum, and uh, Afghans have done that as uh, Taliban uh, took over uh, Afghanistan uh, last year. Uh, those who uh, wish to apply for asylum in Latvia, so their uh, requests were reviewed. Uh, but in this case, this is not the ordinary uh, refugee crisis, so it's, it's quite obvious that uh, these uh, people, probably most of them, are uh, seeking uh, better life opportunities. And, uh, and, and in this case, they can first apply uh, for asylum in Belarus if they're fleeing uh, war, so, so there's no war in Belarus. Okay, let me ask you, Eva. I could see you shaking your head. I mean, this is not an yes. ordinary refugee crisis on the border with Belarus, so it doesn't deserve the ordinary treatment. Is that fair? Um, I would tend to disagree with the previous speaker. I myself now an Afghan family with now already five kids who spend prolonged time in the forest being pushed daily to and from across the Belarus border to Latvia, then back to Belarus daily with kids. And uh, this is a very concrete example that uh, the right to asylum of these people was at least initially for a longer time violated. Uh, these, I also disagree that uh, there is enough grounds to prolong uh, the state of emergency as it, it has been done already for a year. The state of emergency was introduced last year on 10th of August, so it has been in force for already more than a year. Um, there have been um, many pushbacks and uh, what is very important, what have been counted as individuals illegally crossing the border were actually instances of attempts to cross. So these were actually several tens of people or, or um, according to different reports, there's an independent report by, by a researcher and human rights lawyer Alexandra Yolkina uh, claiming that uh, there were altogether 200 to 300 people, not, not uh, more than 5,000 amounting to 6,000. Um, basically now this year we've had almost uh, 3,000 pushbacks. Um, and, and last year we had okay. um, around 5,000. So you, you believe international law is being violated with these pushbacks? Yeah, I, I, I do believe that uh, international law, first of all, EU law is being violated and more precisely directive on common procedures for granting and withdrawing international protection and also the directive on common standards and procedures in member states for returning illegally staying third country nationals, as well as the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU and of course the 1951 Geneva Convention on the Status of for refugees. The principle of non reforma is being violated. The rights to asylum of people, of civilians, as, as uh, we know from reports and also from our um, experience of relatives contacting us, searching for people, these are mostly civilians, including families with children. Their rights to asylum have been uh, severely violated, moreover, part of them have suffered from uh, excessive violence, degrading and humiliating treatment. Okay. They have, as part of them, sorry, just to finish, part of them have also suffered uh, burns and and um, also uh, frostbites, serious frostbites. Some people, I know of, of, of one, one person at least, who has lost his towels. Okay. 
Uh, Euros, I'll come to you then. I mean, let, let's cut to the chase. Why are these refugees being treated differently from the Ukrainians that have been welcomed with open arms by even families in Latvia? Well, um, the, thi the thing is that, uh, as Maris mentioned, this uh, kind of flow of refugees to the border, and, and one must also say that a lot of these people, uh, instead of randomly wa wandering through the forest, have been told that they can go to border crossing points and then they can try to apply for asylum there. I don't know whether that is happening, because part of the emergency is the journalists have uh, no access to the border. We cannot independently check the stories of what some of the refugees are saying, nor can we check whether uh, we should believe our border gods who are saying that, well, we're not you know, committing any brutality against these people. Um, or even to check the credibility of those people. I think some of them would have spoke to the, the uh, uh, mentioned Yolkina as claiming having been tortured and all of that, whether they are credible uh, witnesses. So, so why, I mean, it, uh, help me understand that then. Why, again, why is the state of emergency necessary, particularly when it keeps journalists banned from the area that could shed light on how fair Latvia's operation well, is and that question. it's not mistreating migrants as, they, as it, they've been accused of? That's a fair question. That's what we asked at the very beginning of the emergency last year, why cannot we check what's really going on there? And why cannot we not report? I mean, if a few pe people were admitted for humanitarian considerations, there were some pretty sick and frail people who, you know, they were led across the Latvian uh, border and then they were taken to, to a, um, a refugee facility. Uh, and uh, then, of course, there's the issue of whether we can talk to them. There are hoops that you have to jump through in order to in order to talk to people in, in, in these asylum facilities. So nobody could really get a full story of what was going on. I mean, that's from a journalist's viewpoint. Um, it, as to why the government extended the emergency, what it sees as the, the, the major threat, you, you really have to ask somebody in the government about that. Mm. Um, last summer, clearly there was this effort to to cause disruption and, and, and distress in this country because of, uh, you know, the potential large flood, or by our standards, large flood of, of, of people coming into the country. Uh, we had the example of Lithuania, where it was very hard to, to deal with this. Uh, of course, with the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians are coming from a culture that most Latvians see as very similar to theirs. There is not this image, and I will admit there is this kind of partly uh, prejudicial, partly maybe even uh, not consciously racist view of people from the Middle East as being radically different from us, as possibly being dangerous. We don't know who they are. They have strange customs. They have a, they have a religion that is associated with the terrorist act and all of that. And that, that all plays a role here. Also, the um, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you talk about that, and I want I want to draw on that because that is what many argue is just at the core of all this. Because at its most basic level, you know, Latvians aren't comfortable with people of what they think are of such a different culture coming yes. into their country. You said it, that's interesting that you called it a not consciously racist view. Uh, Yeb, I'm going to return to you for one second because. Why is it that you seem to understand that these are people, as a Latvian yourself, that these are people worthy of asylum ac applications and asylum help and recognition as refugees, while so many Latvians do not? I would say the problem is that uh, many Latvians uh, haven't really encountered uh, strangers, uh, especially people who are not living in the cities, people who have not had uh, a lot of experience traveling abroad or, or staying, not, uh, not traveling actually, staying abroad for longer periods of time. People who have not been exposed to, to representatives of other, other societies and sociocultural environments. So, and, and that is, I would say, fear stems from, from not knowing enough not getting enough of exposure. Okay. And, 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 and then that fear leads to forgetting, us forgetting that these are actually humans. These mm. are the same kind of humans as we are with the same basic needs. Maris, would you even, agree there? 
Uh, well, uh, I have to agree uh, partly with uh, with what you were told that uh, the government uh, might be a bit more accountable and transparent. You know, I think there is nothing to hide, at least from the journalists. Um, uh, but otherwise, also, of course, uh, there are some uh, prejudices in the society. But I think this is definitely not the guiding principle here. The Ukrainian case is quite different. There is an ongoing war, and Ukrainians are searching for. Um, asylum in one of the closest countries possible. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, people that have been, uh, you know, flown, they have you know, been able to afford flight tickets to Minsk or other cities. So they, this is their deliberate choice. And um, uh, also at the societal level, I think it's, it's quite clear that uh, people tend to believe that uh, quite many people from the Middle East are looking for better life opportunities. And uh, most probably Latvia is not their destination. And neither Lithuania or Poland, it's Germany. Uh, so they, they are seeing a slightly different. So Ukrainians, those who do arrive here, uh, so part of them, they uh, start uh, to work um, here also in my university. Uh, there are such examples or uh, try to return back to Ukraine. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, people from the Middle East uh, may be you know, improperly quite often seen as uh, people who are searching for better life opportunities or, and are not necessarily... Uh, war refugees. Uh, okay, but having said but, that, I, mean, uh, I, feel, I feel sorry for the, for these people who are in, in, in this situation. Okay, yeah, but go ahead. I saw you had a comment. Um, um, I really don't see any difference between Ukrainian war refugees and Afghani or Syrian war refugees. That's also a war. It's just uh, the difference is that the, that has been going on and started uh, f further away from us. We don't see it so so directly, so close to us. And uh, I would also refer to Latvian social anthropologist Dacia Zinovska's uh, term, political kinship. We have political kinship with U Ukrainian refugees, but somehow we don't see or develop it with refugees that come from further countries further away. But uh, and al also uh, another argument: yes, uh, we don't. These are all also quite large um, speculations, as, as uh, speakers mentioned. We don't, uh, we haven't had enough access to the border, so we don't know fully who are these people crossing from the Middle East, uh, originating in, in the Middle East, and we also can't make such large speculations about Ukrainian population currently in our country because uh, there there has been a lot of uh, people also going further on, moving further on to other countries, Poland, Germany, the same Germany, right. and also UK and other. You know, I, oh, okay, Yuris, go ahead. Yeah, well, the, the, the other thing, uh, the demographic of the Ukrainian uh, refugees, they are uh, men over the age of 60, because men under the age of 60, between 18 and 60, whatever it is, they, they, they are all required to stay in Ukraine to be possibly uh, drafted into military or civilian-related service of some kind. Uh, so what we get from, from Ukraine here are mainly women and children. And I know this because uh, my wife is shooting a film about, together with a Ukrainian uh, television producer, a film about Ukrainian refugees here, refugee women. And the demographic uh, excludes the kind of people that in all countries, I mean, are, are, are the typically uh, sort of somewhat criminally or recklessly inclined, and these are young men. So there are not very many young men coming in uh, with the Ukrainians. So we, we have no stories of, you know, Ukrainians, you know, drunken Ukrainians rampaging around uh, uh, Old Town Riga, which we had about British uh, people a few years ago. So, okay. Uh, I, I, I need to come back to, to Mara so quickly because I, I have to ask if you think that, you know, extending just the state of emergency uh, is worth the kind of, of negative publicity it's actually gaining for Latvia. And I have to bring up the Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights, who actually wrote a letter to Latvia's interior minister, published that letter, uh, saying that the state of emergency has not only prevented effective transparency and accountability for measures taken in the border region, but also significantly restricted the important work of organizations engaged in protecting the human rights of refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants. Why? I, you've explained why Latvians, you believe, have a right to block this border in a way and, you know, stop the, the influx in a way that they don't with Ukrainians, but still, to go as far, again, as this state of emergency to highlight 
what could be grave violations of human rights and they just will not let it be exposed. Why is it worth it to Latvia? Well, uh, with, uh, with this uh, situation, uh, Belarus has achieved quite a lot. As you mentioned, Latvia gains negative publicity. And today we meet virtually, uh, basically, to discuss you know, what's wrong, if there's something wrong uh, in Latvia. So Belarus has already succeeded. Uh, but when it comes to the criticism that Latvia receives, as I also uh, agreed with uh, yours, uh, Latvian government could be and should be more transparent, because uh, I do believe personally uh, that there is nothing to hide uh, and that uh, access to journalists and other uh, persons of interest should be granted uh, to the uh, border. But otherwise, uh, I deem that the uh, measures as, as such, uh, you know, Latvian policy is correct in this case. Uh, because currently the uh, flow of people is, is not considerable, but at any moment it can increase from uh, dozens to hundreds or even uh, greater streams of people. So, so therefore, the uh, you know overall measures are necessary. But I agree that uh, transparency and accountability uh, should be uh, worked out. Okay, Yeva. I mean, are those legitimate concerns? Do you think? And also, I need to ask you at this point. We're down to our last uh, four minutes. I mean, how will organizations like yours go about trying to fight for the rights of people legitimately, you think, seeking asylum in your country? Um, well, first about the state of emergency, uh, the, the grounds now mentioned are, 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 are these are actually, they, they do with potentiality, with potential increase. Uh, uh, really, there has been uh, some increase in, in um, in August, of people attempting to cross the border, and uh, the biggest number has been 37, but around uh, in, in 15, 16, 20, and so on. There has not really been a, a, a great number. And uh, yes, it, uh, the state of emergency extends the the yeah, also the secrecy that has. Uh, that has surrounded these uh, border areas, and uh, not only journalists, but also NGOs who would, who could extend uh, and would like to extend the humanitarian aid to, to the uh, border crossers, um, also haven't been able to approach uh, approach these people. But uh, if you ask me, and also just one call, for clarification, I'm sorry, uh, till April this year, in these border areas. Uh, the uh, law on emergency situation in these areas didn't allow people to apply at border, border crossing points. So there was no possibility. They had to, uh, then they had to know where to go outside the area where the emergency was declared to be able to apply. But uh, uh, anyway, our NGOs uh, that are uh, dealing with um, uh, asylum seekers and refugees, they get contacted by, by the relatives. Uh, somehow the information spreads and, and we try to do as much as we can. We, we, are, we are, uh, have also consistently uh, insisted on, on, on the access to border and also on, on, on the need to actually uh, observe the right to asylum and at least to accept the asylum applications and okay. consider them properly. I mean, Yuris, do you think uh, those applications will be considered? Will anything get better for the people on the Belarus-Latvian uh, border, or or no? Will they simply be rejected? And this, well, I, we, we have I to be fair, I'm, we're seeing this Europe-wide in many cases. Unless we see NGOs and unless we see journalists get access and to tell the full story from all sides of what's going on, I think the situation will not significantly improve. The only thing is that maybe the, the emergency will simply force a lot of these people to give up on trying to get across the border, which may well have been the intent of it all, because a lot of people left El Belarus. At the end of the day, a lot of people simply went back, uh, and a lot of people have also left Sure, Lithuania. but we're talking about the hundreds that are still there, and a number of them are, are Afghans, for example, that know uh, they don't have a safe country to return to. Yeah, they don't have, they don't have any place to go. So. Right. So... I mean, I, I think it would be fair to consider them, be fair to consider them and maybe to divide their, uh, you know, the, the place where they seek asylum among various EU countries so that we don't have to handle the whole, the whole crew, so to speak. Mm, it's, it's not that many people. That's, that's what uh, is, is a bit sad to hear, that even a small amount of people, so many European countries can be reluctant to accept any quotas, as we've seen in Hungary, Poland, uh, Latvia as well. Uh, we'll see if that changes at all, if there will be forced... Uh, anyone will be forced to change policy, but uh, 
We'll have to talk about that at a later time. Unfortunately, we are completely out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank, really, all three of my panelists so much for joining us. Uh, remember, for our viewers, you can follow us on Twitter. And do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.